Rabbi Sachs, Lady Sachs, it's a great privilege and pleasure to have you with us this evening. Every university exists, it seems to me, to sharpen the intellect through question and answer. This place exists not to provide all the answers, but to ensure that the important questions can be asked. And for those of us who are people of faith, the experience delight in asking questions and thereby glorify God in the greatest gift he has given us, the gift of our minds. And it's disturbing to me that even in academic circles, <coughs> some questions are seen as not worth asking and some arguments not worth having. And education sometimes becomes the transmission of formulae and becomes entirely passive in its aim. And this concern lies behind this evening's discussion. And it's in this context that I'm very happy to introduce Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. That's number three. And number four, of course, there is a view out there on the part of, I think, of untutored minds that the great scientific discoveries of the modern age has somehow refuted religion. And that, of course, uh, is quite untrue, and I dedicated my book, uh, The Great Partnership, to showing that that's untrue. To take the most famous example, Charles Darwin, who loses his faith in the 1830s uh, when he begins to uh, formulate his, his theory of natural selection and, and believes that this proved his Christian faith untrue. And the reason he did so if Charles Darwin had been brought up on a book by, famous book by William Paley called Natural Theology, which contained a very, very famous passage that if you are walking in a moor or a wasteland and you find a stone, you don't say to yourself, who made that stone? But if you came across a watch lying there in the path, you would ask, who made that watch? It had design, therefore it had a designer. And what uh, Darwin was able to show is that they can be designed without a designer, uh, and, uh, or as, as Richard Dawkins put it, uh, if there was a watchmaker, the watchmaker is blind. But who ever thought that the universe was like a watch in the first place? The answer is 18th century scientists. And what Darwin refuted was not theology, but the bad science on which certain theology had been predicated. Actually, if you look at the Bible, you do not see God as a watchmaker. You see God as a gardener. That's how he appears in Genesis 2. And that makes much, much more sense in terms of a metaphor for natural selection. Or take a much more recent example. I would always almost call this providential, if that were not heresy to the man to whom I, with whom I shared it, namely Richard Dawkins. I don't know if you're familiar with this. It's a fascinating story. When the human genome was finally decoded around 2001, to their amazement, scientists discovered that only approximately 2% of the genome, the 3.1 billion letters of genetic code that make up our, our genomes, only about 2% of that coded for protein. And the result was, to their surprise, that 98% of this human genome seemed to have no point at all. And they called it junk DNA. In September 2012, one week before I had a public conversation uh, with Richard Dawkins, the results came in of one of the most elaborate of all collaborative scientific experiments in recent years involving 460 scientists in 34 different scientific institutions, they discovered that far from being junk, the rest of the DNA actually constitutes formulae for assembling some 160,000 switches that switch the genes on and off, and, that, and, just, and thus arose the entire system of epigenetics. And it turns out that this 98% that was thought to be junk is actually vitally necessary for human life. And I was able to have a wonderful conversation with Richard Dawkins, which went as follows. I said, Richard, when the human genome was decoded, uh, scientists 
concluded that 98% was junk, right? And he said, yes. And I said, and now, last week, they've just discovered that it isn't junk at all, but vitally necessary. Is that true? He said, absolutely. It's tremendous. I said, but Richard, you think 98% of religion is junk. <laughs> Might you not be wrong about that as well? And for once, he was silent. Uh, in short, it seems to me that the real casualty of modern science, beginning with Newton and come on in 18 with Darwin, has actually not been religion at all, but rather Aristotelian science, on which a certain amount of the idea that, for instance, purposes are discoverable within nature itself, uh, uh, within which a certain amount of natural theology was based. But it was the Aristotelian science, not the Judeo-Christian faith, that has been affected by this. So it seems to me the current causes of secularization are many, but none of them really touch on the viability of religious faith or its relevance to our lives, whether in the private domain or in the public square. And let me say why I feel that very particularly powerfully here in America. Just being in America is for me something of a religious experience. Why? Because if the Pilgrim Fathers had not believed in God, they would never have set sail for America in the first place. It is somewhat embarrassing for me as an Englishman to recall that they were reliving the exodus and instead of the oppressive Egyptians, they were the oppressive English. And Pharaoh was, of course, the king of England. And of course, instead of the Red Sea, you had the Atlantic. And that is the story. America was the second great story of the Exodus, the second great Passover, if you like. And John Winthrop addressing his uh, fellow travelers on board the Arabella in 1630 sees himself as the second Moses and America as the land of the covenant, the almost promised land. And that tradition runs through American history in a very, very powerful way. The, in 1776, when Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin are sitting, drawing up designs for the Great Seal of America, Benjamin Franklin, with his usual <laughs> flair for diplomacy, uh, designs it showing the English drowning in the Red Sea. <laughs> uh, with the line underneath, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. In fact, he was so diplomatic that I almost suspected he was Jewish. Um, <laughs> whereas Jefferson, with a, m a much more pacific nature, just shows the pillar of cloud and fire leading the Israelites through the desert, as indeed he referred to in his second inaugural address as the President of the United States. John F. Kennedy, the first Catholic to be elected as President of the United States, makes in his classic inaugural one of the great enduring truths about American politics, about politics as a whole. He declares his belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. Uh, difficult to think of any other modern country in which a sentence like that could be said by a president with such clarity. And that runs through all the inaugurals. It is as evident in Lyndon Baines Johnson and Bill Clinton's inaugurals and Barack Obama's inaugurals as it is in those of Jimmy Carter and George W. Bush. Without the Jewish Christian faith there could be no declaration of independence, no statement that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. More specifically, without a profound religious faith, there would have been no First Amendment. Because it was the Oxford philosopher John Plamenax who made the very profound observation that liberty of conscience was born in the 17th century, which was one of the great ages of faith. It is precisely when religious faith is ultimately important to you that you realize it is ultimately important to others, and therefore religious freedom becomes a non-negotiable value. And of course, it was Alexis de Tocqueville who memorably said that whereas in France he had seen religion and freedom as opposing forces, in America he saw them walking hand in hand. 
So without communities of faith, it is doubtful whether we would have an America, doubtful if we would have religious liberty. And doubtful, though, that is a topic for another day, whether we would have arrived at the liberal democratic state or the free market economy. That's another story.